greetings in Jesus name amen God bless you uh, thank you again uh, for choosing to watch um, this video and I also want to plead with you that um, if these messages are blessing your life please remember to like um, subscribe to the channel and um, share with others so that you can bless their lives and also leave a comment uh, in the comment section it helps uh, the algorithm of the mess of the video so that YouTube can cause other people to also see this message and their lives be blessed as you do so like I said make sure to like make sure to comment ensure you are subscribed so that you don't miss out on any other messages and also share with your loved ones that it might bless them the lord bless you as you do so as you walk in partnership with him to propagate the gospel to the ends of the earth in jesus name amen that being said let us pray our father and our god lord we thank you this hour as we have come even to look at your word again to see what you have for us, what you are saying, to gain the right interpretation to your words. Lord, I pray that your spirit will take over, that you will speak through me, you will speak to us, you will cause us to gain wisdom and understanding of your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen and amen. So today, we want to go into the part two of the divinely assigned roles of submission and love in marriage. Divinely ordained roles of submission and love in marriage. Part two. We've done the part one the last time and we've we mostly focused on the role of the woman which is submission and all i'm saying is that these roles are divinely ordained even from the beginning and what is ordained from the beginning does not change and we saw that with the scriptures as we read in the last one saw so, um, what god said in genesis chapter 3 verse 16 and also referencing what god said in first peter chapter 2 verses 1 chapter 3 rather verses 1 to 2 we saw that um, the interpretation from Ephesians chapter 5 that a woman should be subject to submit, submit to the, her own husband in all things as the church is subject to Christ is in consonant with the corpus of the scripture. It is in consonant with the spirit of the scripture. It is in consonant with biblical context. There is no disunity or disagreement with any part of the scripture that pertains to marriage when it comes to that interpretation and we've been able to come to the conclusion that Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 which says submitting to one another was not referring to the marriage relationship but was an ending statement to the address that Paul was earlier addressing the entire church, which you can find all these in the literary context of Paul's letter to the church, which reading Ephesians chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 6 gives you clearly the context in which Paul wrote those letters and what he was speaking about. So we've been able to address that without any ambiguity. So, and I'm sure that anyone who loves God and wants to see him and wants to reign with him for all eternity will take what God has said and change his or her life to comply with God's word. That being said, let's look at the aspect of man. So, that means submission is a divinely assigned role to the women, to the wives, not to the husband God has not called a man to submit or ordained a man to submit or asked a man to submit to his wife in marriage it's not scriptural I don't care what my feelings are nor do I care what your feelings are I don't care what my opinions are 
Neither do I bother myself about your opinion. What we should be concerned is an accurate interpretation of God's word according to the Spirit of God, which is according to biblical context, according to the corpus of the scripture, that the scripture must be in unity, in agreement, and no letter should stand alone. So, that is what we should be after because that is the only thing that will give us eternal life. So when I teach the word, when I read the word, when I study the word, I put my feelings aside. I put my emotions aside. I put my opinions aside and dig to know what God is saying. So that being said, that is what we treated in part one. If you have not got a chance to listen to part one, I will, play, I will advise you that go and listen to part one. You will get a better understanding of all I just summarized. But um, let's move on from here. We are looking at the angle of man's role in the marriage. Now, in that same Ephesians, we come to verse 25. That's where now the button changed and God started addressing men. When it came to verse 24, put a full stop means the address to the women, it's ended and it opens up another conversation to the husbands. He said, Husbands, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. He said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, God's commandment to the man, the role of the man is to love the wife. Why is God commanding men to love the wife? Because the wife has gone, Satan has gotten hold of the wives of the women. And they have departed from the original role. And the commandment and the law of God that God has given them to submit to their own husband. And because they rebel against that, the tendency to love the woman is diminished and is not there. Or might not be there in some circumstances. That is why it came as a commandment. In the beginning, it was not so. God never commanded the man to love the wife in the beginning. Why? Because no man hates a wife that is submissive, that is under his authority. Love ensues automatically when a wife is submissive to her husband. The man don't need to be commanded. That love flows automatically. When a woman is truly submissive to her husband, Except in the case of persecution, where the man wants a woman to submit to sinful lifestyle and the man is, the woman is not submitting. That's a different case entirely. But in a situation, whether it's a, a, a worldly man and a worldly woman, and the woman submits to the, all the ungodly requests of the man, that man will love that woman like there is no tomorrow. Also, in the Christian faith, when a godly man have a wife that submits to him, unconditionally, according to God's word, that man automatically loves that woman beyond measure. And I will show you by the scriptures. I am not telling you my own understanding or my own words. I, am not, I don't speak. One thing you will never hear me say when I teach the word of God is I think, I feel. I don't use those words because what I think and what I feel is not necessary. It's not useful to you, neither is it to me. What's, what is important is what God says. What the Holy Spirit is saying. That's all that is important. That's all that is useful to you and to I. So I focus on that. So now, here, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, 5, is coming as a commandment to the man. He said, husband, love your wives 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that it might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. It shows that the women has some serious debris, some serious things, some serious things that need to be sanctified. That's why God is saying, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Now let's, like I told you, I love empiricism. What we can see and what we've observed, I love it. It brings all arguments to rest. Now let's come to the church. What is the church like? If we don't have to go far, we don't have to open any other scripture. In Ephesians chapter 5, where we are reading, read from verse 1 and see what the church is like. That means Paul writing to the church to put away fornication, put away warmongering, put away bitterness, put away anger, put away malice, put away covetousness. Shows you that the church has some field that needs to be cleansed from it, admonishing the church the sense that it's a lifestyle that is befitting for a Christian, that those things should not even be named among the saints. It means the lifestyle that is not befitting is named among the church. In the same way, the lifestyle that is not befitting of a woman married, especially in Christ, is seen in the life of the women. And that is the life of rebellion and stubbornness and disrespect, disregard to the husbands of the authority. It is seen, but God is saying, as Jesus has not cast out the church despite of all these behaviors, his husband do the same. Yeah, she's rebellious. Love her anyway. She's stubborn. Love her anyway. She disregards your authority. Yes, I know. As God, I can see that. But I want you to still love her just like I, Jesus Christ, love the church despite their rebellion, their disobedience, their shortcomings. And I'm still following them by love. Why? So that I might sanctify them, that is, cleanse them with. Um, cleanse them, uh, sanctify them, and cleanse them with the washing of the water by the word. That is, that I might sanctify them, wash them, and make them holy with the word. I might continue to preach the word to them, teach them the word of God, which is why Paul continually wrote the church, all the letters. 90% or 99% or 95% of the letters, epistles, were written to the church. Not to one believers. We were addressing the church to put their, thing, their character right, to get their games right. Right? That's what Paul God is saying here. He said that Jesus continued to send his word to the church so that he may cleanse the church of their filthiness and perfect them with the washing of the water, which is the word of God. And you see Paul sending these letters, the word of God, to all these churches to cleanse them, to perfect them. In the same way, the husband is the head of the family. He is the priest. He is the pastor of the family. The church is the smallest, the, the, the family is the smallest unit of the church. And you, husband, God has placed you there as the head, as the pastor in charge of that parish. He wants you to bring your wife to the knowledge of God's word. Cleanse her of all those filthy behavior, all those feminism, all those filthiness that the world has put, of the, put on her. All those worldly ideology that she has grabs here and there. He said, use the word of God to wash those things away from her and continue to love her as she misbehaves. Love her and use the word of God to bring her to that understanding now before i go further to explain this further for us to understand the challenge in loving a person who is like that i told us earlier that in the beginning god did not command the man to love his wife because love automatically ensues when a man has a wife that is subject to him that is all you need to do for a man to get the best out of that man, to get the best of his love and his care. Let's go back to Genesis. If you want to know how things are or what God intended, go back to the beginning. Jesus told the Pharisees, in the beginning it was not so. That what God has said in the beginning concerning marriage has not changed. That's what, in nutshell, what God was, Jesus was telling the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 19. He said, in the beginning, it was not so. In other words, what the Lord, what God Almighty has said concerning marriage in the beginning has not changed. So whatever changes you're bringing is not from God. 
is because of your rebellious heart is because of your stubborn heart is because of your wickedness is because you want to do your will and god we allow you to do your will you call it permissive will no god is not god doesn't have any permissive will god is permitting you to do your will and when you do your will you will be on your own in the last day so let's go back to genesis genesis chapter 3 um, let me start from verse 16 where God started with the women and then we move further Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 he said unto the woman he said that is God said I will great, gr greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be of thy husband and he shall rule over you all your heart desires as a woman will be for your husband, will be under your husband. Your husband will own your desires and he will rule over you. Your desires will be subject to your husband and he will rule over you. That is what God says in Genesis in the beginning. Now, that is for the women. I've addressed the women in part one. I'm focusing on the men now. Now, let's move to verse 17 where God started addressing Adam. And God said, and Unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cause it cursed is the ground for thy sake. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Tons also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herbs of the field. Verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it was thou taken for the dust thou art and unto dust shall thou return did you see adam love your wife there tell you i don't give you my interpretations or my desires or my opinions when it comes to the word of god i simply go to look at what god is saying in consonant with the corpus of the scripture now, look at it. This is man's own judgment. Did you see Adam love your wife? No. God never commanded man to love his wife in the beginning because once a woman keeps her own part in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 3 of submitting, giving her desire to her husband and allowing the man to rule over her, to have authority in decision making and in everything and in leading being the captain of the ship in directing where the captain the, the ship the vessel which is the family should go god doesn't need to tell that man to love that woman because love will be automatic where you're seeing husband love your wife is because there is a falling away of the women from the original commandment that god has given them just like the church don't keep the commandment that God has given them. Otherwise, there will be no need for Christ to cleanse and to remove all those filthiness and to cleanse them with the word of God. Otherwise, they will be made perfect already and they will walk in the way of the Lord. But because there is a fault in the woman, because there is uncleanness in the woman, because there is rebellion in the woman, because they have followed feminism, they have followed the government of the Western world. They have followed the cunning craftiness of Satan. They have followed the ideologies and the philosophies of men in marriage. So because of that, the man is wounded because the woman becomes unlovable. And that which is supposed to be automatic, it's no longer automatic. And men think that God will justify them because the woman the woman has fallen or the woman is the one who messed up now coming back to that genesis you see that god never justified adam though it was the woman that messed up though it was the woman that put him in the condition where he is 
God did not justify Adam. Neither will he justify the Adam of our days because the women are corrupt and messed up. And that is why the commandment came to help man in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Let's go back to our original scripture. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husband, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Love her, despite all those filthiness you see in her, because it is the commandment of God. Yes, has she failed? Good. Let that be her judgment or her own re um, problem with God. You obey God. You do that which God naturally expects of you. God's word is not conditional. When God asks the woman in verses 22 to 24 to submit to her husband, God never said when the husband is obedient to his word or when the husband is loving her. Inconsequentially, it doesn't matter God never said when the man is loving to the woman, when the man obeys his word to love her, then she should submit to that man. God didn't say it. He didn't give that condition, right? He said, submit to your husband. And came in came in First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, and said, even to the unbelieving husband, that your submission and your chest conduct could cause him to repent. That means even to the one that doesn't love you, submit to him. Now, in the same vein, God has not told the man that he should love that woman that is submissive to you. He said, love her, irrespective of how she behaves, irrespective of her stubbornness, irrespective of her disobedience, irrespective that she is not subject to you. Lord God is saying, love her anyway and work hard to bring her to know him by breaking the word of God to her. In other words, it means you as a husband, you ought to know God's word. Teach her God's word. Speak to her with God's word. Bring her to her senses with God's word, if possible. Verse 27, he said that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spots or wrinkles or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish so that you will present your wife to yourself when you able, when you are able to cleanse her with the word of god and win her change her transform her give her understanding give her wisdom and remove all those fields that the world has put into her through feminism through whatsoever women write through women empowerment all those nonsense that the world has thrown at them the the quality of man and woman you know, which I don't want to go there. If we go to the empiricism of that now, you see, <laughs> it doesn't stand the test of time. But however, let's move on. So, that you may drive all this nonsense away from her by what? By the word of God. Not by shouting. Not by beating her. Not by anything. Not by whatsoever. But by the word of God. You need to know the word of God as husbands. And use the word of God to, to bring your wife to be that glorious woman, that beautiful woman, that beautiful Eve that God created to be a helpmate for Adam in the very beginning. You can use the word of God to change that woman, to transform her life, and to bring her to be that beautiful Eve that God has ordained and created from the beginning. That beautiful Eve that God talked about in Proverbs chapter 31, the or I call it the virtuous woman, that beautiful woman, that virtuous woman, God said it is by the word of God that you will apply in her life that we bring her to that state and bring her to a state where there is no more blemish, there is no more filthiness of the world, but her heart being transformed by the word of God, she will know that which is right and that which is not right before God. Verse 28 says, So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now, God is saying, As Christ loved the church, so man is supposed to love his wife as his own body. He said, No one 
uh, as his own body. He that loveth his wife loveth his own body. The two shall come together. The Bible talks about it later as we go in there, but I don't know if I'll read it, but let's see. The two came together and they became one body. Your wife is a part and parcel of you. You don't hate your body. You love your body irrespective of how it's doing or what it's doing or how it's behaving. You don't cut it off because you love it. Christ is saying the same way, love your wife as your own body. Now let's come to that issue of submission again and loving. Now, does a man, a woman, do you submit to your body? No. Your body belongs to you, the soul, the real person. Your body submits to you. Your body is subject to you. You only love your body by taking good care of it. And when the body the body is weak or sick or whatsoever, you out of love, you take care of it so that it will last and serve you better. But your body is what that submits to you. You want to go to wherever, walk down to the store, your body, your leg submits to you and obey what you want, the command you're giving it. Let's go to the store and your leg follows. You want to take something on the table, your body submits to you. Your body, your eyes, you want to look at something, your eyes submit to you. Your eyes are there to serve you. Your body is there to serve you to do, accomplish what you are doing. You are watching this video because your body is subject to you. And God likened the relationship of the church and uh, um, Christ as being one body and uh, Christ being the head of that body and the body being subject or submissive to the um, head, the leadership, which is Christ. In same vein, God likened the marriage relationship as one body, which it is one body, according to the word of God. For the man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. We also have in that Ephesians chapter 5. But however, they become one one flesh, but there is a head. The body does not, the head does not submit to the body. The body submits to the head. So, looking at it pragmatically also, and also empirically, you can see like I've said earlier, that you don't, there is the word, the, the word submitting one to another in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 does not apply to the marriage relationship. That verse was a continuation of what he was saying in verse 20 and all he has been saying, the, the Bible has been saying from Ephesians chapter 1 to ver, up until verse 21. It is submission in the church, leadership, Leaders submitting one another, brethren submitting one another to one another in the church to cause the church to function right. But when it comes to the marital relationship, to the marriage, he gave the specifics according to God's word that is expected. So if your body or you don't submit to your body as the owner of the body, your soul, your person who controls the body, you don't submit to the body, but the body submits to you and you love your body, take care of your body, make sure your body lacks nothing, gets all it wants, food, care, rest, whatever, hygiene, you take good care of the body, medication, treatment, when it's weak, you give it rest, everything, you pamper the body and take good care of it. That is exactly what God is saying. Wives, submit to your head, your leader who owns you as the body. And the head love your body as Christ love his body, which is the church. So because your your leg is paining you or is hurting you or maybe it's causing you pain, as your wife could be causing you pain, do you cut off the leg because the leg is causing you pain? No. What you do is you try to cure the pain of the leg, to take care of the problem of the leg. And that's what God is saying to the husbands. Take care of the problem of your wife with the word of God. Feed her with the word of God. Love her and show her what God's words say. That you may renew her mind and transform her to that perfect Eve that God created to be a helpmate unto you. Verse 29. This for no man ever hated his own flesh about dress this, but nourished and cherished it even as the Lord the church. The same way the Lord nourishes the church and cherish it, and cherish the church and nourish it with the word of God. Same, God is saying, cherish, love, and nourish your wife with the word of God. Now, I am going to leave uh, the rest of it and I'm going to jump to the last verses. Which is verse 32 and 33. 
This is a great mystery. I speak concerning the church. That's when he's talking about that this is a great mystery, he's saying the mystery of husband and wife coming together, or man living in his home and joining together with the with the. But let me start from verse that one. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. That is what he's talking about. He said this is a great mystery, that they will come together and become one flesh, and the flesh is subject to the head, to the leader. To the owner of the flesh, not vice versa, not you know um, submitting one to another. No, the body submits to the head, like I've explained earlier. You see, but I am speaking concerning Christ and the church. His the analogy he's giving more is that of how the church is subject to Christ as the body of Christ. So he said he wants the wife to be subject to the husband as the body of Christ, but commanding the husband to love the body, which is the wife, as Christ loved the church, irrespective of the filthiness that he sees in the church. He didn't abandon, he has not abandoned the church to date, but working hard to cleanse and to push the church of all filthiness, to present the church a glorious uh bride unto him in the last day so same way that husbands should love their wives and present them a glorious bride now before i conclude i say something else i want to come to that loving issue sometimes women argue or feel that the word of god has marginalized them <laughs> on the contrary it's not so although god does not marginalize anybody it looks as if what god has commanded the man or the woman to do is harder and women rebel and complain and god why will i submit why will i submit you know i'm telling you flip the role and ask the women to love the man let the man submit the women will still complain back then you will hear complain because they will understand how difficult the man's role is how challenging the man's role is is the role of man greater than the role of God to the church? No. God has given man the role of Christ in the relationship. So if the church play greater role, sac more sacrificial role, more demanding role than Christ, then know that the role of submitting to your husband is a greater and more challenging role than it is to love you as a wife who is rebellion and stubborn. Like I said, I love empiricism. Let's come to empiricism. What we can see, our experiences, what we can observe. Let's come to real life scenario. You walking in your place of work. You have this boss, a very mean boss, doesn't smile, doesn't care about your feelings at all uses you in the way that you want to drain life out of you. Now, let me ask you, do you still submit to that boss? Of course you still submit to that boss, that's why you have a paycheck. But can you love that boss? Is it easy to love that boss who is behaving that way? Who is wicked? Who is oppressive? Can you be able to love that boss except by the grace of God? Is it easy to love that boss? How easy it is it to submit to that boss? And how easy it is it to love that boss? Tell me which one is easier. Ah, you know the answer, right? Okay. It's a no-brainer. You can submit to someone you don't love, someone you may never be able to love as an unbeliever, but you can submit to that person for decades working under that person because he's your boss. And submission is required. And you just do it because it's required. And you will submit perfectly without any error. Have you seen how the how easy it is to submit in submission even to someone who don't like you, who don't care about you, who persecute you? You can submit to the authority. But that person will never gain your heart. Your heart will never love that person. But flip it. That is what God asks man to do. To love to that to love that woman who is rebellious. 
that woman who is adulterous, that woman who does not submit, that woman who is cantankerous, that woman who does not regard the man, that woman who does not have any regard of the authority of the man and disdains that man. Tell me, how easy is it to love such a person? So that you understand the role that Christ plays in the church, do the church behave such to Christ, but yet Christ still loves the church and cherishes it and treats it with the word of God so that it may, he may present the church a glorious church. In the same vein, God has given man the same role he's playing in the church to play in the marital relationship. To love a rebellious wife, to love a stubborn wife, to love an adulterous wife, to love her no matter what, and work hard to bring her to terms to the knowledge of God with his word. Let's also come to empiricism. Let's say you are working with this your boss, who is supposed to be your boss, and uh, you now usurp authority. You are rebellious to him. You don't obey him. You don't submit to him or her who is your boss. Do you think that boss can love you? He will fire you. That is the practical thing to expect. That is what we can observe empirically. That boss will get rid of you. Your job is done. You have, will have no more paycheck. So, you see the natural reaction or response to when you disdain a man's authority is to deal with you. That is the natural expectation. But God has commanded that boss in your office who you will not obey his orders, who you will not do what he has asked to do, who you will not submit to his authority in the office, you do whatever you want, God has commanded that boss, said, yes, though this your subordinate, this your employee is rebellious, is stubborn, does not regard your authority. I want you to still keep her in the office. Love her and try to teach her with the word of God and make her to understand that rebellion is not good. How many bosses do you think will be able to do that? So do you understand how difficult the role of the man is that it's not easier than submission. Submission is easier. You can submit to anybody and get what you want out of that relationship. Whether it's your work, your boss, wherever. Whether it's friendship. But you can't love someone who hates you. Someone who does not regard you. Someone who does not submit your authority as a leader. The right thing to do is to fire that person. But God said, do the contrary. So men, take heart. If you believe God, and agree with his word and ask him to help you, he will help you. He has helped many overcome the challenges that they found in marriage and still love their rebellious and stubborn and adulterous wives, submit, obeying the word of God and loving them anyway. You can still do the same. Ask God for grace. I come in verse um, 33 of Ephesians chapter 5 to wrap it up. In verse 33, Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself. And let the wife see that she reverence her husband. Conclusion of the whole thing. Let every man see that he loves his own wife as his own body, as Christ loved the church as his own body. The woman that you submit reverence means you fear, you honor, you submit under the authority of your husband. That is the conclusion of the whole thing. It does not change. It does not contradict. So if Paul was saying in verse 21 of this same chapter, Ephesians chapter 5, that women and men should be submitting to each other, then that would be contrary to his conclusion here about the marriage relationship. This verse 33 does not agree with verse 22, 21 rather, when it comes to the marital relationship. Then what is Paul talking about? You see, it, it won't make any sense. 
So you cannot bring that verse 21 and say that what God is saying is that a man should submit to his wife and a woman should submit to her husband. That is not true. That is counter scripture. Look at the conclusion. Death, nevertheless, in all that I have said, nothing taken short of all that I have said. Don't remove anything from what I'm saying. That is what nevertheless means. I am not speaking less of what I have said. I'm only concluding. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself. Conclusion of the man's commandment. And wife, the wife to see that she reverence her husband. Honor your husband. Submit to him in, as authority. Reverence to honor authority. To submit to the leadership of authority. See that you hold him in reverence, in high honor and fear. That is what God has commanded to the woman. And I pray that the Lord will help us as husbands and wives to play the God-given role that he has given us. The divine role, which is the word of God, which may determine, or most likely will determine, our eternal destination, whether we obey or we disobey. My prayer and my heart desires is that you will be among those who obey God's words and live by them all the days of your life. In Jesus' mighty name. May God release the grace to do so even more abundantly. In Jesus' gracious name, I have prayed. Amen and amen. God bless you.